it has it's been a pleasure coming here today because this um, this uh, morning I had the pleasure of understanding how lost you can get without a city map. Basically, I've been running around the whole of Berlin this morning, um, couldn't find out to read my Google map correctly, had a lot of good, uh, good exercise, and uh, I'm very happy about, about that. So nothing is as bad as it isn't good for something, at least. So it's the same way with architecture. We need some kind of uh, way of working towards something. And that something is typically uh, architecture modeling, for instance. That something is also the agile methodology. So if you come, came to this talk today to understand a lot about deep technical things, um, that's uh, not the, 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 the way that I'm, I'm, I'm looking into. I'm looking more holistically into uh, sustainable uh, architecture in an ag agile organization. So thank you for having me, and um, let's get started. Uh, I'll just uh, first have an introduction, then I'll talk a bit about the challenges I see, and a little bit about sustainable IT, and then in the end, uh, uh, about opportunities. Uh, when we work in an agile organization with architecture, what should we think about, and how can we uh, merge those thoughts into our work? So, what, 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 why are we actually, what is this all about? Um, well, basically, we are in a situation right now that we are uh, um, in uh, the whole EU. We are legislated rather heavily on uh, the green agenda. What does that mean? It means that we have some CSRD requirements that are uh, reporting requirements for all uh, larger organizations that they have to be uh, able to uh, report on from, uh, actually, it's actually uh, turning into force on January uh, 24, but the first reporting will be in uh, January 25, as far as I understand. Then also we have the ESG um, requirements reporting that we are also uh, regulated by, um, why is this interesting when we talk about Agile and architecture? Well, it's interesting because that we are, um, when we loop back and we look back, and w when you are as old as I am, uh, we had, you know, we went from on-premise to the cloud. We didn't really have any good standards for security, IT security. We built that up with a lot of different ISO standards, etc. We had a bit of you know, uh, the, the good old West uh, on data uh, and uh, sharing of data. Uh, so we had GDPR and le legislation around that. Now we are in a new situation. It's not because we haven't done it before. Actually, architects and agile organizations are pretty good at being flexible and uh, agile towards new changes. So let's also be agile to this new world of Sustainable, uh, sustainable reporting. And it means that basically we, we are going from, it could be nice to be a bit sustainable, it could be look good branding wise, to no, we are actually going to be a uh, report on how much CO2 we are emitting as organization in our operations. And, um, and that's a change. So, then we sit back as architects or the agile team and think, well, that doesn't have anything to do with us. Ah, uh, not really. It does have something to do with all of us. It will impact all of us in the way that we work, and that's why I'm here today. So why is it relevant that I'm half Greenlandic? This big, wonderful island up north and half Danish, you'll find out later. This is when I lived in Greenland. We have this super modern bang, bang in the uh, banks, you call it. Um, and I grew up in this beautiful, beautiful land that is melting slowly and slowly. And what did that mean to me as a technologist? It meant stop. This is my country. 
This is this beautiful nature. I was living out um, in, a, in a very, very, very far away part. I would play out in the icebergs. I would go fishing these super ugly fish that my mother, she was like, oh yeah, that is so beautiful, and nobody would eat it. And then I would just have a, have a laugh and have fun. And what I really liked about it was the community of going to the mountain to sing the, the sun down for the winter, because it was dark the whole winter. And then you went to the mountain again to sing the sun up. And there was this huge respect for nature. It was very like you were inside nature, living inside that. And that affected me very much through, throughout my life, uh, working in different organizations. Um, this has affected me hugely, that nature is really, really important. So throughout the years, I've been working with as a um, solution architect, IT architect, senior IT architect, R&D domain architect, enterprise architect. Yes, about a decade as an in different architecture roles, both in, in not agile organizations and in agile organizations. I see plus and minus in, in each uh, um, in, in, on each side of that, and also on the hybrid side of that. Um, then I have worked with leadership, IT leadership as well, and then recently I decided after losing my beautiful, beautiful mother, who is Greenlandic, that I need to do something about this. I need to help putting focus, spreading the good news of what we can do in the organizations around becoming more sustainable around IT. Anyway, just to say, I worked in pharma, I worked in biotech, I worked in manufacturing, in banking, pension companies, insurance companies, I've been around. That kind of says it about my, uh, my age. So, as you know, if we keep going like this, the Greenlandic ice can raise the waters around seven meters around the world. It sounds like something that you just hear, and something that is basically, okay, yeah, we all, there's also war, we have, a lot, we have a lot of problems, but, you know, hmm, it, it's not really, has, doesn't have anything to do with me. It does have something to do with all of us, and we are all able to make a positive change. One of the things that, that actually I think is immensely shocking is living in this little beautiful country, Denmark, as I do now with my family, and hearing about, you know, killer whales around the coast, we have sardines, we have uh, um, tuna, we have all kinds of beautiful creatures coming to Denmark because of the waters are changing uh, immensely. You know, in Denmark you can actually now go on a safari, seeing those beautiful new types of um, uh, water uh, animals that we, with, that we have in our oceans, and, and that is beautiful, but it has a sad background. And um, the tempers are changing, and that's why we are wh where we are today. When we talk about what we do, the way we, we live, I don't think as a consequence of what we do and how we live our lives, none of us do this to be bad people. We have just done whatever we wanted to do in our lives. We have just tried to kind of make the best we could, but when we look at the Earth Overshoot Day in uh, Denmark, um, that was basically, we have used all our resources by March 28. In Germany, uh, it is by, um, I can see that it's May 4. Um, so if you kind of put it up like that, then you'll see that we are actually using more resources than we should. We also see that if we had to continue to live like this, we actually need, in Denmark, we need four and a half Earths. And in Germany, you need three. Good for you, that's better than, than, than uh, we have in Denmark. Thumbs up for that. And also we see that we have a rise, an increasingly rise of um, uh, 
different natural disasters. Um, this goes from 81 to 21, but as you know, this summer has proved that we are actually moving. If we saw it from 21 to 23, I bet that it will go like this. So we don't have to look far in our little beautiful part of the world. This summer we had different floods. You know, we have had a lot of fires. It's heartbreaking, people impacted by this. It's not heartbreaking what we can do about it, and that's what I want to focus on. So what is actually the problem that we are, that we are moving into now? Well, what, what, what is te what's technology uh, doing in, in this? Um, well, technology is, is, has been, if you look at um, the carbon footprint over time, you can see that if you look at music, we had uh, everything on vinyl, CDs, uh, etc., cassettes, and, um, and it, it increased a lot uh, the waste for that and the environmental cost for that. And then when we hit around 2013, 2016, uh, it kind of fell down again because then we moved to digital or the music was moved to digital. Um, then what it means now is actually that is moving towards data centers. Files are, of course, being hosted in data centers. We need somewhere to, 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 um, to get it, right? And as it, as it looks today, data centers account for between 2.5 to 3.7 of the global gas um, uh, CO2 emission. That's pretty much. We also see that the energy consumption of data centers will rise even more from the predictions that has been made so far. If you look different places, there will be different numbers. So um, you will always have to be critical to the, the information that you have, but on average, that's, that's the numbers I have seen so far pretty uh, uh, often. So this is something that hit me. You know, quote from Harvard Business Review, the information and communication technology sector as a whole by 20 40, it is expected to account for 14% of the world's carbon footprint. And that is up from about 1.5% in 2007. That's a lot. So I don't think that there's any doubt that we'll have to do something about it. And that's also why that the EU have made this uh, legislation that we need to do something mandatory. Mandatory, all of us because the way that we work, all of us, will be reflected and be more transparent in the future when we need to, to report on CSRD reporting. As you can see here, there are different ways that organizations have the ability to, to um, reduce their carbon footprint. Either they can try to reduce it themselves and uh, report on that, what they do to reduce their carbon footprint in their operation, from physical buildings to technology and everything. And, on, on also to, um, uh, they are also basically able to sell carbon footprints, uh, oh, sorry, uh, um, sell uh, carbon uh, taxes, credits, sorry. Um, so there's a market around carbon credits where that is raising, as you can see on the graph, is basically going up, the price is going up and up and up because it's, you will be taxed more heavily if you're not uh, CO2 uh, friendly and um, actually reducing CO2 in your operation. And, uh, and that's basically, um, they are trying to make it hard, basically. So the ESG requirements, I'm not going to go so much into that, but the part where we in, in uh, Agile teams can do something different in the way that we work is more or less the environmental part, um, looking more into renewable fuels, um, looking on how we are working more energy efficient, um, and how we recycle uh, or reuse the things that we are working uh, with in our daily uh, lives. 
So the CSRD, just to, for you, those of you who doesn't know about it, is called the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. That is a mandatory reporting coming for everyone in um, about 50,000 companies uh, in, uh, in the whole of Europe. And um, later on, it will be expanded in 2028 for the other uh, parts of the world. Um, and the ESRS then is a framework that you can use in order to, um, to with, with dif different metrics on ESG and CSRD. So what does it mean for us? It means that we are, the Paris Agreement are impacting the ESG reporting, the CSRD reporting, the Sustainable Ability Standards, TTO, certificates. So that's also a consequence that the procurement functions will start looking at, you know, what criteria do I buy my software, hardware, my physical items. Um, TCO certificates is a, is a way of, of um, ensuring that it's, um, it's actually something that uh, have taken sustainability into account. So that's something that will affect your organization's procurement department. You who sit in the teams who are interacting with procurement every time that you need to acquire new licenses for something that you need to develop or configure or what you need to do with it. Um, and then basically the work that you do will also be more transparent um, because we have to prove how much we emit in the organizations. And then also, as a consequence of what you do in your teams, your customers will also see the work that the, the products you, that you uh, sell, the services that you sell, what is the effect of uh, CO2 on those services uh, on long term. So I'm not going to say all this, but these, these very, very clever people have said some good things about this issue. I think I'm just going to say the one that I'm actually closest to because I have three wonderful teenagers. Adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope, but I don't want your hope. I don't want to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. I want you to act. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act if the house is on fire, because it is. And then we have all the other beautiful, clever people like uh, Obama and uh, Emmanuel Macron and, and Jane Goodall who have said uh, similar things about the environment. So let's move on and put on those, uh, take off this, these gentle uh, gloves, you know, being gentle, not really telling things as they are, but actually see things as they are, the state that we're in today, and do something about it. Put on the dirty gloves and do something about it. So, the good old Walt Disney is always is, he is known for his, if you can dream it, you can do it. But what I want to say, and I want you to imprint in, your, in the back of your mind, I hope that you can walk away with that today, is if you can green it, you can do it. Because we can actually do things more green than we do today. We also see that the trends are, are, are working towards that future of clean technologies have to be, uh, the, the, in 2050, uh, has to be around 75%. Um, and uh, that is basically of global energy that will be uh, produced uh, on clean technologies. That's a big target. So what is sustainable IT? Sustainable IT is efforts to ensure a positive impact on the environment with regard to the production, you guys, the use, the customers, and disposal of technology, us people in the organizations working with technology. It's also environment-focused approach to the design, use, and disposal of computer hardware and software application and the design of accompanying business processes. Also, we look into uh, the, you working with a, a circular economy mindset when we work with technology, following those principles. 
That means that we are going from a linear way of working to a circular way of working. The relevance for this is that we are driven by the ESG, CSRD, the TCO certificates, the carbon credits, all the legislation, the taxes that are being pressuring uh, organizations and us as workers to do things differently. So there, there, there are many different solutions uh, that uh, the world um, uh, that, that are looked into. And of course, that what is very much hit in, uh, for us in the technology sector is uh, clean, uh, looking at, at uh, using um, uh, clean uh, energy. And, um, and also, I think that we, we need to look into uh, how we, we, we look and find out what are the hidden emissions that we don't see today when we work with technology. The procurement process is one of the processes that are very much relevant to look into and discover where you can actually uh, make different choices. I went to a conference and I spoke to a conference and I went talked with this very clever man from a software company, hosting company, and he was came to me after the talk and he said, with tears, honestly with tears in his eyes or nearly tears in his eyes, that he had been working in the hosting services for 21 years, and nobody had ever asked him about whether it was, um, you know, should I choose A, B, or C, and would one of them be clean energy? He had never been asked about that. So he, would, he was very fired up by my talk because uh, he thought that it was something that we, with high relevance, high, high re relevance, for the, for in the technology sector, because basically, honestly, if we don't have any customers or consumers of our products, you know, we'll just keep doing what we do, right? We need to think circular and look at this. I want to recommend a book, and I want you to write this down if you are writing notes. There's a book called Sustainable IT uh, Playbook for IT Leaders. It's written by Niklas Sundberg. What I like about this book is that you can actually go in and you can see that there are uh, what different parts of your, um, of your IT end-to-end -end process. How can you do calculations for CO2 emissions? Because how do you translate CO2 emissions when you're coding, for instance? So I want you, want you to, uh, if you're interested in the subject, I would definitely recommend you to look, in, look into that. So this is from his book. His book is talking about, um, basically, this is cloud service provider, pro providers, um, commitments, and uh, how they are working towards net zero. As you can see, Microsoft is very much focused on that area. Uh, we have Google very much focused on that as well. And then basically, when we look down from there, it's getting more and more red, right? I know that, for instance, AWS, Netflix, they buy a lot of carbon credits. So that's a way to, to kind of for them to work towards their goal. As you can see, their goals are um, to go uh, net zero is um, a bit later than uh, the others, um, but they're also big. Um, Actually, it's, it's, I can't see it over there, but it's, it's a bit later uh, than the others. So basically, uh, the big players in the market are basically, they know that they, they are, this is something that they're being assessed on and pressured on. So basically, we have to think about this as an organism. You know, one of the things that I, I have seen as being a bit of a challenge is that agile teams can sometimes sit a little bit isolated away from everything else. So, but we need to integrate the way that we work in all the aspects of an organization's uh, business processes and units and how they work. So we can't save the planet because we don't have the ability to go out in the space and you know remove all the space junk, uh, you know. Let's try to to focus on the area where we have some kind of control, and uh, in doing things differently than we are doing today. 
So, if you follow a common path, that's a good way to start, as I think. You can't drive a car without a license, right? You can't become a pilot without uh, following protocols. You can't become a doctor without following security procedures. You can't develop software without following principles. So why do I say this? I say this because I've been in different organizations and what I have seen on the left side, you can see we have law. That's all the regulations that we have been through over time, GDPR, new IT security standards, etc. And then we go down in our organization and we work on the strategy to ensure that we got it all. And then we go down and do some governance around it. And then we, 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 took, we operate and put it into operation. As you can see on the green circles, I think today that we are very weak on that in, in, in the experiences that, that I have. So I think it's super important that there is a link from the law, the strategy and the governance and the operations all the way down. And this is why I think it is immensely important that agile teams and architects sitting in agile teams are on top and open to, um, to uh, ensure that uh, what is actually happening in, the, in the, the organization. What should I learn? Is there anything I should, I should ch shall change? So I think that in the, when you govern, you strategize, and when you integrate your different, um, uh, for instance, um, these uh, new uh, rules into your, the way that you work and you execute on it, uh, it has to be something that you either work top down with or with uh, bottom up. I would suggest that it's starting with top down, and that is something that I know from experience that agile teams probably are not always thinking it's a really good idea to have top down processes, and they have to, you know, take something into the team that somebody else said they had to do. Uh, and of course, I understand that it's important to have freedom and be self leading teams, but if we have to change as a whole, we have to think as a whole. And basically, if you look at this model, which is like you got your frameworks from, from, the, uh, from the legislation, then we, pu we put it into our strategy, then it's very important that the tools that we use today in our organizations, it could be our EA tools, it could be our IT investment tools, it could be our uh, risk tool, um, our planning tools, it could be Jira, uh, Asia DevOps, whatever you use in your daily life there has to be the aspect of uh, sustainability uh, uh, aspect in that. Because when you ex execute on this, um, it will be basically be, be part of how you work, that this is something that, that is part of my, my story, user story, it's part of my epic, it's part of my roadmap, it's part of my architectural runway. So I think very much from the strategic point of view, you have your vision, you know that you have to do something, you have to establish some clear um, objective key results, drilling down the organization that everybody is measured on that has sustainability um, dimensions in it, defined by the business, defined by uh, the legal requirements. Then it comes down to the tactical and the operational and then basically all levels are able to, to, to basically do something different. So the opportunities that I think, let's, uh, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna do it a little bit quick. So software doesn't consume energy by itself directly. Um, it directs and influences operation of, com of computer hardware and thereby impacting hardware's energy consumption indirectly. And this is why the Green Software Foundation has made some principles around this. How can we be clever about how we work? You won't be able to see what's on this, but what I can say is that, again, when we look at how we strategize, we will typically have the EU re regulations from this point of view. We put it into our tools. I will definitely recommend that in the Agile teams, you will have some, point, some kind of input for a data visualization of what do you do in your team 
to uh, differently to reduce uh, uh, CO2 in your work. Because for the organization as a whole, as an organism, every step of this needs to be um, uh, catching uh, everything from, uh, you know, um, how you integrate the EU regulations into your existing frameworks. Do you use uh, TOGAF? Do you use uh, uh, C4? What, what, what method, methods do you use in your company? Then when you go to in the, in the development process, you go to the maturity phase, you are able to uh, be, you know, find out and identify the requirements uh, that you need to, um, in order to uh, uh, create a solution around that. Then you will assess it, and you are able to integrate sustainable principles on that part, uh, finding out, okay, conceptually, I have, uh, I have some uh, things that, um, some new uh, features and uh, uh, business requirements that I need to uh, work on, and then when you, you deep dive into that, uh, it is important that you look into working, having a life uh, cycle analysis, looking at what is the life cycle of what, what the needs are from the roadmap, from the epic or from the feature. Then it's also important to look into what uh, principles can I be guided by when I stand with this roadmap item, epic or feature, um, and what can I do about it from there. So you get the idea, then you develop, and there are different um, things you can do in the development phase and the execution phase. I'm just going to go into this one first because this one, I think, is more important because the time is running out. This is the sustainable architecture in our, uh, the green pin principles for, from the Green Software Foundation. Basically, this is one of many different principles already being uh, out there, available to work from in the different, uh, um, in this phase of, of uh, development, in the development phase, basically, and also uh, during execution. I'm not going to go through all of them, but what I want you to know is that basically, if you look back on my old model here, and we double click on the, on the, on the phases where we mature our uh, business requirements, we assess our business requirements, and then we develop our business requirements. F on those three stages, there are principles available and inspiration available in order to actually uh, work with, uh, for instance, life cycle assessment on requirements, as I said before, uh, on the web, on the UX, they are working on, they're soon releasing some principles on US. It's like a thousand UX people in the world have, have uh, got come together on that. And then on the architecture, we have both uh, the, the, the Green Software Foundation doing architecture principles on, uh, on, your, in, on your architecting work, and then also on the development gr using green coding principles for, green, for, for uh, when you actually develop uh, and code in your teams. The same with um, um, the AI. Yeah, we know that AI is also something that is very energy heavy. Um, so that is something that uh, is also you, something you can find. Uh, uh, the procurement, as I said before, there's a lot of focus on the procurement phase when you sit in your teams and you work uh, with, uh, uh, and you have to procure something, uh, you probably have this uh, TCO certificate you'll look into, and then it can guide you and help you become more sustainable in the way that you assess the vendor. Then we have testing. There's also some great um, inspiration and principles around that. So one last thing I think I want to say here is that I feel that we are already, when we sit in the teams, one of the things that I think we could uh, optimize is that to categorize data a bit more. We have active data, sorry, we have hot data, warm data, and cold data. In many organizations today, uh, we have a, a big uh, portion of inactive data, cold data, dark data, whatever you call it. 
So when you sit and you make your, your sustainable solutions and designs and UX sustainably, architecting sustainably, following these, following these principles, um, then uh, labeling data from the beginning is a really good idea. Because then you can move, if you find out what is dark data, inactive data, cold data, from the beginning, uh, and you, uh, in your process of working and developing, coding, architecting, then you can actually uh, move that, either delete it, um, or you can um, uh, move it to uh, a green, a green uh, uh, energy-friendly hosting. So that is something I think that we could be a bit better at uh, in the teams, because we have a lot of data just being there, increasing uh, technical depth that we don't uh, use or do something about, and nobody is using the solution or things like that, so it's very important to uh, be aware and actually uh, be conscious about uh, data uh, use. So, basically, I don't think um, I think don't think I have more time now. So I think I'm going to actually um, stop with this slide here and just say that I think that fundamentally we are already doing a lot of good things today. We're not doing bad things today in the organizations. This is another topping of the, uh, the, of the cake. Um, we have learned from GDPR, IT security standards, um, and we, this is a new learning, and basically what I think, think and feel is basically pretty simple. We have principles in place. They should be mandatory in your organizations. You can adjust them, you know, create your own, uh, make it yours, but I do think that it will help a lot already from tomorrow, looking at those li links and finding out, okay, um, maybe I should use it from tomorrow, looking into it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before I start with a question from Slido, one question on my own, there are so many links and there's so, such a dense amount of, or uh, high amount of information. Will your slides be available somewhere? Uh, I will uh, definitely, uh, I might have to cut a bit down, but definitely the links you should absolutely have because that is something practical that you can use. Yes, I will so share that. You will share that, that's great. Now to the Slido questions. Uh, the most upvoted question is, um, what be, would be some concrete things you would uh, recommend agile coaches or software architects to do tomorrow? Yeah, the, I think that the product managers, product owners, and the solution architects have to be much more interacting about. For instance, I think the life cycle assessment is one of the things that you can't, as a product owner, product manager, have all the competences and skills and knowledge to ensure that you, um, that you know the corners of the consequences of that need from the business or from a client. So the solution architect is, uh, or the software architect is absolutely vital to understand and conceptualize uh, and, 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 and be a, a partner in doing the life cycle assessment because that will, that's basically where the, it all starts with the sustainability impact on that delivery. So life cycle assessment of um, the sustainability impact would be the place to start for I think th that would be a good place to start. And I also think the principles at adhering, basically testing out the principles, so looking at the principles, take them home, talk with your uh, team about it. And then also I think it's very, very important. I've been all, both an, an IT leader. I've been sitting in ID, uh, agile teams in the old days as well. And I think there's a big disconnect. I think it's very important with communication, understanding the whole from strategy, tactical, operational level, and care about it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. The second, no, I'm not, I'm not finished oh, yet. You're not <laughs> I got one more at least. Okay. Um, these, um, can you suggest tools to quickly establish a feedback loop that helps assessing the footprint of the software we produce and run? Please repeat. Can you, are there any tools that you know of out, uh, out there in the wild? that can help uh, assessing the footprint of the software we're producing. So do we have to do that all ourselves or is there some 
some tooling out there that can. Oh, this. absolutely, there are tooling out there, and I'm so sorry that I don't have any links on that because okay. I, I have to be honest and say it's a jungle, and I'm s it's such a good question. Thank you for that question. I want to <laughs> I want to recommend one at least. It's something called Gaia Gen G A I A new word G E N. That's a software that can help you um, being more green conscious about how you uh, do your deployment process. Basically, uh, it can, it can uh, close servers down, uh, it can uh, direct uh, your uh, work to a greener grid. Uh, super cool. That's one of the ones that I would definitely look into that. Also, I would suggest, for instance, uh, if you use, uh, uh, for instance, architecture tools such as, as Linux, they, uh, they actually have some capabilities where, they, they, uh, where you can measure if you do architecture modeling. You can go in and you can put in the ESG requirements, uh, at some point also the CSRD requirements, so it's related to your work and your modeling process. Okay, that sounds quite interesting. I'm guessing you'll be around for a couple of minutes more yes. so that people can ask you Absolutely. in detail, gather names, gather links and whatever would be more helpful. Absolutely, you're welcome. So, thanks a lot for your talk, once again. Thank you. Thank you.